right, so this morning uh, we'll be in Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to look at the first uh, seven verses this morning. And the title of the message is The Return to Our First Love. The Return to Our First Love. And um, before we, we start looking at the Word of God together, let me go ahead and open up in, um, in a word of prayer um, this morning. Well, Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful day, Lord. This, um, it's a little windy, Lord, but we know that you made this day, and we will rejoice in it, Lord. We thank you for this beautiful time of worship that we had this morning. We thank you for um, just giving us the opportunity to come here together, Lord, to, to worship you, to seek your face, to hear from you this morning, Lord. We pray that you fill us, fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Help us to focus on you this morning. We know that you have a word for us. And uh, we just pray this morning that um, you continue to shape us and mold us. Help us to look more like your son, Jesus, Lord. Help us to have that desire, Lord, to run after you. And this morning, once again, we thank you for this time, for this opportunity. We pray these things, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So over the past um, several weeks, there's been a lot of talk about revival. And um, I know we talked about revival a little bit this week in the men's group. Um, we talked a little bit about it last week uh, with, the, with the young people there in the youth group. But um, when you think about revival, as believers and as the church, uh, that revival always starts when we're on our knees. And in order for that revival to take place, it needs to start within our own individual hearts uh, first. And um, we know that as believers that the church itself is made up of individuals, so you and I and all those who believe. And the temperature of that church, the, the, the state of that church is dependent on the individuals because they make up um, the church. And our hearts need to be in that right place, in that place of, um, of surrender. And oftentimes, we leave that place and we have to come back to that place um, where we once were with the Lord. And God is so good because sometimes and often he will use things in our lives, whether it's illness or difficulties or, or, or just taking away those things that are distracting us that we've put our hope and our, our efforts and all of our energy into for the purposes of bringing us back to him, um, our first love. And this morning, what we're going to see is what this kind of looks like for the church there in, in Ephesus, as the Lord speaks to this church through the Apostle John. Um, and he's also speaking to us as we live in this current uh, church age. And this morning, I don't know where everyone's heart is um, with the Lord, but you do and the Lord knows. And maybe you've left your first love, or maybe you've just recently come back um, to your first love. But what I want to share with you this morning, what I want to encourage you with this morning is that he will always be there uh, with open arms waiting for us because God is so good. And I know for me, um, because I'm not the smartest person, in the flesh, I often want to leave my first love, which is the Lord. And he has to wake me up and I have to come back to him. And he's used difficulties in my life uh, to do that. And I'm sure he's done that in your life as well. He's used different circumstances to bring you back to him. And he does these things because, you know, he loves us. The Lord loves us. He's our father. He's our heavenly father. So before I get into the actual um, study, let me just give you a little bit of a background of what we're looking at here in the book of Revelation. So uh, what we see here is that the Lord is writing these letters to the seven churches there in, in Asia. And if you look at the structure of each of these letters, and we're going to see this as we go through this um, first letter to the Ephesians, is that he addresses a specific church. There's an introduction to himself, Jesus, the Lord. Um, there's a statement about the condition of the church. There's a verdict from the Lord about the condition of that particular church as well. Um, there's a command from the Lord to that church. And then there's an exhortation to all Christians. And then finally, the Lord promises um, a reward uh, to that particular church. And when you think about the church there in Ephesus, um, Ephesus was a famous place in the ancient world but it also had an equally famous church. And when you think about Ephesus, this was, this was a great city known for its um, religious, cultural, and economic systems. And Ephesus, however, was well known for the Temple of Diana, um, the fertility goddess. And unfortunately, she was worshiped with sexual immorality. 
And when you think about the temple of Diana there, it was this tremendous temple. It was, it was enormous. It was regarded as one of the seven wonders of, um, of the world, of the ancient world. And many evil things, practices took place there in Ephesus. But as I mentioned before, there was this equally famous church where some great things were happening um, for the Lord. So before we actually look at the text verse by verse, let me read the entire text to us, or we'll read it together, and then we can, um, we can just kind of break this down a little bit further. So here in Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, uh, the Apostle John writes for us, Write to the angel of the church in Ephesus, Thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. I know that you have per persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet you do have this. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen. So notice here, the first thing we see with the church here in Ephesus is that the Lord is addressing the church specifically, and then he also identifies himself. And we see this here in verse number one. So it says here, um, write to the angel of the church in Ephesus, thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven lampstands. So notice here that the Lord's addressing this angel, right? Well, who is this angel that um, is being spoken of here? Well, if you look in the first uh, chapter there in Revelation, um, there in the latter part of the chapter, the Apostle John describes this vision that he has of the risen Lord. And if you look in verse 20, it says there, the Lord identifying himself, it says, The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven gold lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So this particular angel could be perhaps the pastor of that particular church there in Ephesus, or the angel could be an individual keeping an eye on that state of the church there in Ephesus. Um, this individual is some sort of representative of the church there. And um, this letter is not just addressed to that angel, but to the church um, as a whole. And when you think about the church in Ephesus, this was an assembly that um, enjoyed some solid leadership, right? You think about the Apostle Paul, for example. He ministered there for about three years. If you look in Acts chapter 19 and Acts chapter 20, it, it talks a little bit about his time there. Timothy was also there. If you look in the first, um, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and then, of course, the Apostle John himself. So this was truly a, a place of great privilege and great preaching that took place there. And in Ephesus. And when you think about this, though, the Lord here, he's reminding them that he's the one that's in control of that particular ministry, right? It says, thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven lampstands. So once again, looking back in chapter one, here in the book of Revelation, this image that is painted for us here shows us the authority of Jesus in the church. He's the one holding the seven stars. And also his presence in the church, right? He is the one that walks in the midst of the seven golden um, lampstands. So Jesus, therefore, should always be the center of the church. Jesus is the one holding the churches firmly because they belong to him, just as he's holding the church firmly now. And it's so easy to, to put a, a pastor or a leader or a teacher on a pedestal um, because we have to remember that pastors and teachers, they're actually gifts from God himself. 
If you look in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it, it reminds us of this. So individuals like, like pastors and teachers, they can be taken away at any time. And that's why as a church, we have to make sure that our focus, our worship, is on the Lord and not some specific person. Because at the end of the day, you know, we're just men, right? We're all people, and the Lord's just using us. And then if you move on to the second verse, um, and the third verse, I'll, I'll combine the two of them here. Um, what we see here is that the Lord knows everything. He knows a lot about the believers there in Ephesus. And um, it, it shouldn't be a surprise to us, right? Because the Lord, he knows everything. In verse 2, um, John writes for us, uh, the Lord speaking, I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. I know that you have persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name, and you have not grown uh, weary. So once again, notice here that the Lord is well aware of the works of the Ephesians, right? He knew everything that they were doing. He knew everything about them. Absolutely nothing we know is hidden um, from the Lord. And I think sometimes, you know, in the flesh, we think that we can hide sin, we can hide corruption within the congregation, but it's not true, right? The author of Hebrews in chapter 4, verse 13 reminds us, no creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I know your works, he says, your labor and your endurance. And the Lord knew that the church there in Ephesus, they were doing some great things. They worked hard for the Lord. They had this godly endurance. And if you look, at the, look up that word endurance, the, the original Greek form there means a steadfast endurance. Okay, this was a solid church. And I think this is a beautiful thing for the Lord to say about the church that you're a part of. And I know um, this is something perhaps Angel has in his heart, we all have in our hearts, hopefully, is the Lord would think that about our church, Right? here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, that we were a solid church and the things that we do for him. But then furthermore, the Lord was aware that they did not tolerate evil people, is what he, is, um, what he uh, references here. And if you think back to the time when the Apostle Paul was there ministering in Ephesus, um, for example, if you look in chapter 20, Paul warned the Ephesians of such people um, that they needed to keep an eye on. And if you look there, beginning in verse 29 of Acts chapter 20, um, he says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert. Remember that night and day for three years, I never stopped warning each one of you with tears. And this is certainly something that they needed to be aware of in that time, but also that we need to be aware of, of in this time as well, right? Because there are people that are going to come and they're going to want to divide and they, they're going to want to deceive and we have to be very careful. We have to guard ourselves. And just like the Bereans there in, in, the, um, in the book of Acts, we need to test everything by using and knowing the word of God, right? So we have a responsibility you know, we can't just be fed the Word of God on Sundays and on Wednesdays or when you have small studies, but rather you need to feed yourself throughout the week. Uh, that way you have this knowledge and this wisdom to help you when those things do happen. And when you think about um, apostles, for example, or messengers in particular, you know, you think about even today, there's some great deceivers out there, and we have to be careful. Everything should always point to Jesus Christ because that is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will always point um, to Jesus. Now, in the third verse, um, he tells us, I know that you have persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name, and you have not grown weary. So as we continue, they continued moving forward with great endurance, and they were doing all these things without growing tired, without growing weary. Um, so you, you see this picture of the Ephesians. They're, they're busy for the Lord. They're doing all these great things. But despite all of this, there was something wrong here. There was something going on. And in fact, the Lord addresses this in the next verse, where he talks about um, something that he had against the congregation there in Ephesus. 
So in verse 4, what we see here is this, this thing that he had against them. He says here, But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. So hearing that word but there in, in, this, um, in this verse here in, in Ephesians chapter 2, it's kind of this sobering thing to hear. You see, once again, these, these individuals, they were doing some great things for the Lord. But because the Lord sees our hearts, he sees our motives and everything that we do for him, nothing is hidden from him. And even if you're doing all these great things, if your heart's in the wrong place, if your motives are wrong, none of it's going to matter. And in fact, this reminds me a little bit of what the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you look there, um, Paul is, is speaking of the role of the believer and their responsibility for building upon the foundation of the church. And in fact, there he reminds us that everything will be judged by the Lord. And as believers, we know that the judgment we are going to face is the judgment seat or the bema seat of Christ, which we read about, for example, in Romans chapter 14, where we will be judged for our service onto the Lord. And there are going to be rewards for that, right? We've talked about this before. The, the, the following five crowns, right? The imperishable crown, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, and the crown of life. And then Paul, he reminds us there once again in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, um, beginning in verse 13, he says, Each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved but only asked through fire. Now the term fire there, and I believe is referring to the Lord's judgment. And we know that the Lord sees everything, doesn't he? Um, and it, you know what's interesting is if you look in Revelation chapter 19, um, beginning in verse 11 through 13, there John is describing the Lord's return um, with his heavenly army. And there he describes his eyes like fire, like flames which kind of gives us an indication that the Lord sees everything. He's judging everything. He knows everything. There he says, Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and with justice he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So once again, the Lord knows our hearts. He knows our motives. All of those things are going to be judged. They're going to pass through the fire. And if we've worked hard for the Lord, for anything other than our love for the Lord, then it's all wasted. And when you think about the Ephesians, once again, these were individuals that had abandoned their first love. The love they had at first is what the Word of God says here. So there was trouble here. It was trouble in their hearts, trouble in the hearts of these congregation of these congregates, therefore trouble in the heart of the entire congregation as a whole. You see, they looked great from the outside, um, but what we do for the Lord, yes, it's important, but why we do it is more important. And I think one thing we need to ask ourselves, and I want you to kind of think about this for a little bit, you know, why are you doing the things you're doing for the Lord right now? You know, are you doing them to get attention? Are you doing them to, to please the pastor? Are you doing them to please people? Do you have your own agenda? And these are some very serious questions that you need to answer before you serve the Lord, before all that can be resolved. Colossians 3, 23 to 25 tells us, whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no uh, favoritism. So we want to do the things we do because we love the Lord, and we want to please the Lord. And in order to love the Lord and to please the Lord, we need to be back at that place again where we are with our first love. And I was thinking about this, and I want you to think back to when you first believed on the Lord. 
when you put your faith in that gospel message, right? You believed with all your heart that number one, Jesus died for your sins. Number two, that Jesus was buried. Number three, that Jesus rose from the dead three days later. You recognized you were a sinner. You asked the Lord to forgive you and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There was repentance in your life, right? There was a change in your life. Do you remember how you felt when you did that? And I was thinking about that, and I remember just being so in love with the Lord. I just wanted to be with him. I wanted to learn so much more about him. He was everything. And, you know, some people call this the, the honeymoon phase with our relationship with the Lord. And um, I'm not a married man, but, um, you know, those of you that are married um, you can relate to this. You know, my, my dad used to always tell me that as you grow in your marriage, you and your wife, your love should continue to grow. And you need to be careful not to fall into habitual or routine love. And you have to fight for that honeymoon, life, that honeymoon love rather, every single day. And this is similar to our relationship with the Lord. Every single day, we need to fight for our love for the Lord. We want to have that honeymoon love every single day. We don't want to fall into this routine love where we're just doing things. We're going through the motions. Yeah, we love the Lord, but we don't love him like we used to love him. And that's something we need to be very careful of. We see this um, with the Ephesians. I think what we need to understand is that labor will never, ever be a substitute for love. We need to love first so we can labor from that love for the Lord. And in fact, James talked a little bit about this, where faith without works is dead and works without faith is dead. And we know that that faith comes from that love, right? We love the Lord. We put our faith in the Lord. And because we love him, he's able to use us to do all these wonderful things for him, right? All those works will come from the love and from, from that faith. And nothing else should matter. But I think um, what we can, I guess the, the, the encouraging thing here, maybe the, the light at the end of the tunnel here is that when you think of the Ephesians, they abandoned and they left their first love, but they didn't lose it. They didn't lose this love. Like the Lord didn't take it away from them. Um, they didn't lose it. But what they once had, the love that they once had, they didn't have it anymore. And to me, that's a very sad, a very, very um, sober separating, I think, a very sad thing. And when you realize that um, when you leave something, when you, when you leave something, you have to realize that it's done deliberately, right? And the reason why we leave things is because we're selfish, we're in the flesh, uh, we have our own reasons. And when you leave something, however, you know exactly where to find it. Um, have you guys ever lost something in here? <laughs> Did you know where to find it? Probably not, right, because you, you lost it. Right? Maybe you find it a few years later in the mattress where the couch is or, I don't know, in the car somewhere. Um, but you don't know where to find it. So you've probably lost it forever. But in the case of this love for the Lord, they had just left it. And they knew exactly where to find this love. And once again, when we lose something, we know exactly where to find it. But in this case, right, the Ephesians had left their initial love. Um, they didn't lose his love, and he didn't take it away from them. And, you know, they knew exactly where to find it. And we do too, right? When we, when we step away from the Lord, when we leave our first love, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit, we know exactly where to find it. I love what Charles Spurgeon once said regarding this. He says, a church has no reason for being a church when she has no love within her heart. Or when that love grows cold, he says, lose love and you lose all. So when you think of the Ephesians, what exactly, um, what exactly did they leave? Well, you know, I think a good illustration of this can be found in the Gospel of Luke. And you know, I remember talking about this with, with the young people several months ago when we were in the Gospel of Luke. But if you remember, in the 10th chapter of Luke, um, if you look there beginning in verse 27, there was an expert of the law who tested the Lord. And he asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He asks the Lord. And then the Lord tells him, what is written in the law? And then he answers the Lord. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So what we see here, and I believe, is not only that they leave their love for God, but they also left their love for one another. 
Because you can't have one without the other. You can't say you love God and not love the church. You can't say you love the church and not love God. Right? That's hypocritical. You have to have the love of God first before you can love the people in the church. And you can't love the people in the church and not love God. That doesn't make any sense. And we cannot put what we do for the Lord before who we are in the Lord. And I think that's, that's a big lesson we can learn from the Ephesians here is that they were so busy for the Lord, they forgot to be busy with the Lord. And I can tell you in, in my walk in ministry, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes serving the Lord. And a lot of those mistakes have stemmed from being busy for the Lord and not busy with the Lord. Because he wants to be busy with us. He wants to do these things with us, right? He's called us to do them. He's empowering us to do them. And when we start doing things for the Lord, we're so busy moving around, doing this, doing that. We're doing these things in our own ability. And we need to learn from those mistakes, right? And, and I, I'm so grateful for the Lord, for his patience with me and his long suffering because he's, you know, he's had to correct me many, many times. Um, and, and you learn from those things. Now, with the Ephesians, once again, there was, there was something different, right? Something was different with her relationship with the Lord. Things were not like they used to be. And I love how one scholar uh, regards this. He says, when we were in our first love, what would we do for Christ? Now how little will we do? Some of the actions which we performed when we were young Christians, but just converted, when we look back upon them, seem to have been wild and like idle tales. And, and what a beautiful place to be, right? the things that we used to do for the Lord out of our love for him. And I guess things that maybe at that time, or maybe now seemed crazy and, and out of, you know, out of um, the ordinary. But of course, in that time, because we were so in love with him, it was a normal thing. That was normalcy for us because we love the Lord. Now, as we move on here, um, and we'll, we'll kind of park here for a little bit, what we see is, yes, the Lord saw that the Ephesians were doing these great, wonderful things for the Lord. Um, he had to rebuke them, though, for leaving him, leaving their first love. And then what we're going to see here is exactly what the Lord desires of them to do. Okay, and this is in the, in the fifth and in the sixth verse. So there he says, remember then how far you have fallen. He says, repent. And do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet you, you do have this, he says. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So certainly we know, for example, um, like from the book of Ezekiel and from 1 Peter, that before the Lord judges the world, he's going to judge us. He's going to judge a church. He's going to judge his own people. And we talked a little bit about that judgment right before um, in, the, in the previous section. But when you think about this, there were some steps that the Lord had outlined um, for this process of reconciliation with the church there in, um, in Ephesus. And in reading and studying this, it was, um, it was just very reminiscent of what we've been talking about in our men's study on Wednesdays. And, you know, there we've been talking about the life of the patriarch Jacob. Um, and one, one of the things we talked about recently was his return to Bethel. And remember that the Lord, he had this encounter with the Lord leaving on his way to Haran there in Bethel. And then the Lord called him to come back. But if you think about the process that Jacob went through there in the, um, in the uh, 35th chapter, the 28th through the 35th chapter, um, there is this process of remembering there was this process of repenting, and there was this process of returning to the original basics or the original works um, with the Lord. And when you think about Jacob, once again, um, when he returned to Bethel that second time, in a sense, returning to that place where he first experienced the, the Lord, returning to his first love, um, it began in his heart, right? He remembered, he obeyed the Lord, and remember that when he obeyed the Lord, the Lord had commanded him to go back to Bethel, then what he did is he started getting his family's heart right with the Lord. Remember, there they were removing, removing idols and worldliness from their presence. And then only then were they able to make their way back to Bethel um, 
to, to have this, uh, to be back with the Lord, where Jacob had originally had this first encounter um, with the Lord. And I think one of the things that is important here that we talked about um, this week is this just, this just shows us the importance of headship in the family, right? You think about God the Father, God the Son, the husband, the wife, and the kids, right? There should be this alignment. There should be a straight line. And when the husband's heart is not right with the Lord, he's not with his first love, the likelihood of his wife and his kids' hearts being aligned with their first love is, is highly unlikely. And that's why it's very important um, for, for us as men, as leaders in our households, to make sure that we're always with our first love. Our hearts are right with the Lord. And, you know, that's an easier said, an easier said thing than done thing, right? Um, but once again, those are things we have to fight for, to have that honeymoon love. Because there's people um, that we're responsible for, and we need to be very careful. And in order for a family to return to their first love, it must begin... Um, I believe, with the husband. But going back to Ephesus, so there's just a little bit of an aside there that the Lord had put on my heart. Um, the first thing that the Lord tells them is to remember, right? Remember where they once were in their love for the Lord and even for one another, okay? He says, remember, right, what you've lost, where you've been. And this reminds me a lot of the prodigal son, right? And everyone, everyone knows that story, right? We read about it in the Gospels. And when you think about the prodigal son, it wasn't until he was in the midst of the pigs there in the pig pens where this, this um, restoration came upon him, right? He remembered what life was like back when he was at home with his father. If you look in Luke chapter 15, verses 15 through 18, it says there, then he, the prodigal son, he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his census, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And we all know how that story ended, right? He, he went back to his father, and his father received him with open arms. And this is all stemmed, once again, out of remembrance, remembering where you once were with your father and, and going back to him with his open arms. So he told them to remember. And then secondly, he told them to repent. And this is very important because when you think of repentance, it's not just feeling you know, sorry because you got caught, but there should be a change in your life, Right? When I think of repentance, let's say I'm going in this direction. If I'm going to repent, I'm going to be going in the complete opposite direction. There should be a complete shift in direction. There should be a change in my life. But God is so good. He's so just and he's, he's righteous and he's willing to forgive. You know, 1 John 1, 9 tells us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And a lot of people call that the, the Christian bar of soap. And uh, we can trust in the Lord. And once, once we confess our sins to the Lord, we're able to move forward in the Lord, not sinless, but desiring to sinless, right? Because we're not going to be sinless on this side of, of, of heaven. So he says, remember, he says, repent. And then lastly, he tells them to return to their, to do their first works, right? Is what he says here. And this means that they needed to kind of go back to um, the basics, if you want to call it that. You know, the things that they were doing when they were first in love with the Lord. And when I think about when I was first in love with the Lord, you know, I think about like the excitement and all the time that you would spend in the Word, you know, because like you wanted to know all these answers. Um, the time you spent in prayer, the time that, you, you know, you spent desiring to be filled more and more with the Holy Spirit to be in fellowship with other, the other believers. You know, we know that those things are the foundation of our walk and the Lord and our love for the Lord. But unfortunately, the enemy does such a good job at, at distracting us from those basic things. And what ends up happening is we start to look elsewhere in pursuit of happiness, in pursuit of fulfillment, and in pursuit of hope. And that's where we have to be very careful. And I can tell you from my own experience, um, you know, I've done that many times where the basics, because 
and I've, I've allowed the enemy to get into my mind and my flesh to, to, um, to lead me have not been enough. And you start to um, desire to seek help elsewhere or do other things. And, you know, quite recently, I, I kind of experienced this. You know, as many of you know, um, I've been facing some pretty serious, I guess you could say serious health issues over the past several months. Um, around December, I started having some uh, trouble with the functionality of my heart, which was very strange to me. I, I kind of think of myself as maybe kind of a healthy person. So, you know, it was very strange to me to have that going on with my heart. Um, also recently, there was some hemorrhaging um, in the tissues of a brain tumor that I'm also uh, been seeking treatment for for quite some time now. And have you guys ever wanted something so bad that you were willing to do anything to accomplish that? Um, that's what I kind of encountered recently where all I wanted was to be well. I just wanted to be better. And unfortunately, that took me away from my first love at times because my, my hope and my focus was on treatments, it was on doctors, it was on the next appointment, it was on the medications, whatever it was that these physicians had for me next. And um, the first time I really felt something like that was several years ago. And those of you that have taken on the role of a caregiver, you know, you might be able to relate to this. But uh, several years ago, um, I moved back to El Paso and I, was, I, um, I took on the role of a full-time caregiver for my mom. My mom had a massive brain bleed, and I took care of her for several years, full time. And I remember in that time, I just wanted my mom well so bad that my hope, my, my focus, it left my first love. And it was on treatments, it was on doctors, it was on um, different things to make her better because I just wanted her well. When all along, the Lord just needed us to rest at his feet and truly understand that he was the only one that could heal her. And we just needed to be with our first love, which is the Lord. When my dad got cancer, I went through the same thing. I went through the same cycle. I just wanted my dad well. And, and then the Lord had to teach me that lesson again. Hey, rest in my peace. Give me your burdens. Give me your difficulties. Just be with me, your first love. And that's what I needed to do. And then because I'm a very stubborn person, um, dealing with my own personal health, I kind of went through the same cycle, putting my hope in treatments, in appointments, and you get to a point where you start to run out of options. And when you run out of options, all you can do is, is run back to the Lord because he's the only option. He's our only source of hope. And coming back to the Lord, you know, begging the Lord to help me, you know, the Lord reveals a lot of things to you, right? He just wants you to understand that the reason why he's doing this is because he needs you to be close to him. He needs you to be um, right beside him. And, you know, often we pray, Lord, draw nearer to us. Help us to draw nearer to you. And he has to use these things. And I can tell you, when you come to the Lord with complete surrender, you can rest assured that he'll give you the peace that you need for the moment. And God's taught me a lot. He's taught me to be at peace in the moment. He's taught me to be content with the current situation um, that I'm going through. And it's been very hard, but I'd rather be sick physically to be well spiritually um, and be with my first love. Because the truth is, my worst days are actually my best days. Because I'm able to see that God is good, that God is trustworthy, that God is faithful, that God is just, and that God never leaves us. And he's never left me. He'll never leave you as well. I know he's using this once again in my life to, to keep me close to him to keep me in that place where I'm just so in love with him um, and to be at that place of peace. It's not that I don't have enough faith to be healed physically. He just hasn't healed me physically so I can have more faith, I truly believe. And I love what Charles Spurgeon once said. And you, if you think of Charles Spurgeon, this was an individual who suffered a lot from depression and, and mental illness, if you want to call it that. He says, health is set before us as if it were the great thing to be desired above all things. It is so. I would venture to say that the greatest blessing that God can give to any of us is health, with the exception of sickness. Sickness has frequently been of more use to the saints of God than health has. And certainly when you're like in the greatest afflictions, that's when the Lord 
you can have the most intimate experiences with God when you're the most afflicted. And that's something I I've, I've certainly have learned. But another thing I want to address is that, and we, we saw this once again with the Ephesians, is when you leave your first love, you also leave that love, in a sense, from the people around you because you're no longer with your first love and that love for others stems from your first love. And those of you that know me are very well, in the flesh, I have a tendency to do this. Um, I, I tend to keep things to myself and like to go th through things by myself. And it's mostly to keep people from worrying. But once again, that's the flesh. That's my mind, you know, thinking. That's Isaac. But the truth is, if you love people, you're going to want them to go through the season with you and be a part of the bigger work and the blessings that the Lord has for you. And when you think about being sick physically, it's so easy to isolate yourself because it's a lonely time, it really is. But when you do that, then your, your mind and your heart, it becomes a playground for, for the enemy. And we need each other, right? Galatians chapter 6 tells us that we need to carry each other's burdens. We need to go through this together. Um, and, and that's what we need to do. But the only way that's possible is to have that love for each other, which stems from being with our first love, and that's the Lord. And I can truly say that in this season, um, you know, the Lord is good, not just sometimes, but always. And I know that my life is in the hands of the great physician, my first love. He's the great physician. If anyone's going to heal me, it's, gonna, it's going to be the Lord. But going back to the Ephesians, notice that the Lord warns them, okay? He tells them if they don't do these things, he says, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And you know, a good way to think of this is that if there's no change or repentance there in the church in Ephesus, he would remove the light or his light. And if the light of the Lord is not within the church, at the end of the day, it's more like a club and an organization. It's not really a true church of Jesus Christ. And that's kind of a scary thing. Could you imagine the Lord's light being removed from here and we're just gathering for the purposes of gathering, the Lord's work is really not being done here. That's kind of a scary place to be. And then notice, though, at the end of this rebuking section, that the Lord says, Yet you do have this. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So once again, he ends this section of rebuke with some encouragement, right? Something that they're actually doing right. And the Nicolaitans were actually mentioned again in verse 15 of this similar chapter, in the same chapter rather, when the Lord is speaking to the church there in, in Pergamum. And there he condemns the practices of the Nicolaitans, if you read there in verse 15. Um, and of course, their practices involved immorality and idolatry, uh, similar to those that were following um, Balaam. But when you think about the Nicolaitans, like who are these people? Well, the word Nicolaitan means to conquer the people. Um, these were false teachers that were there amongst. And one scholar describes their practices in this way. He says, like all deceivers that come from the body of Christ, claim not that they were destroying Christianity, but that they were presenting an improved and modernized version of it. And this sounds a lot like some of the things we see in the church today, right? Kind of progressive uh, Christianity, where we, we change the Bible to change with the times, when in essence we need to change the times to change to the Bible, right? Because the Word of God never changes. Now, some scholars suggest that the Nicolaitans, they reasoned that the human body, like the flesh itself, was evil anyways, and only the spirit was good. Therefore, anything you did with the body really wasn't that important, because um, the recipient of grace and um, salvation was actually the spirit and not the flesh. And that's why you could do anything with your body and you would still be okay regardless, which we know is a false doctrine, right? That's a very dangerous thing. It's kind of like, that's almost reminiscent of the, the hyper grace movement where like you're saved and then you can just do whatever you want because you're saved, once saved, always saved type of thing. Um, but you, there's no change in your life, right? If there's no change in your life, then really, maybe you never really did believe initially, right? And the Holy Spirit never really came into your life to change you. So those are things that we saw with the Nicolaitans, and um, they hated them, right? Just like the Lord says here. And for the Lord to say, which I also hate, and of course they were the practices, the sin, right? Because the Lord doesn't hate the sinner, he hates the sin. Those are some very powerful words coming from 
someone who is love. So whoever these people were and what they practiced, we see that the Lord hated it, and we know that the Lord hates sin, and as his people, we too need to, we need to hate sin. Not the sinner, because we're all sinners, right? We just need to hate the sin. And we saw this with the church there in, um, in Ephesus. And then if you look here in the last verse, the Lord shares an exhortation and a promise with the Ephesians. He says, Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So notice the Lord is addressing all who are willing to hear, both there and even today, as we read this together this morning in this current church age. So here he has made a promise to the one who conquers. And you're thinking to yourself, well, what, is, what do you mean conquers what? Well, I, I believe what they're speaking of here is overcoming their lack of love marked by leaving their first love, okay, and resulting in the lack of love for others. And when he tells them as if they're able to conquer this, he promises them a return to Eden, to restoration, right, to this promise of eternal life. And when you think of um, what we read about, for example, in Genesis chapter 3, um, there it tells us that sinful man was banned from the tree of life. So when you read this, it should remind you of, of heaven. Heaven should come to our mind. Um, something that we can enjoy. We can enjoy the blessings of that now, right, through the relationship that we have with the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, through his word. Um, but we can enjoy that with greater measure in the future. And the word of God tells us to have our minds set on things above and not things below or things on the earth. So this is something that um, perhaps would be an encouragement for them to conquer this and return to their first love and their love for one another, and I think for us as well. So in closing this morning, um, we saw that there was some great things happening there in the church in Ephesus, but unfortunately, there was a problem with the hearts of the congregates there in, um, in Ephesus, right? And therefore, as a, bo- as a body as a whole, the entire church, they had left their first love and their love for each other, and the Lord was very clear what they needed to do, right? They needed to remember they needed to repent, and they needed to return, right, to their original or their um, first works, right? The things that they did when they first believed that kept them in love with the Lord and loving the Lord. And as I mentioned earlier, I don't know where everyone's heart is this morning. And, you know, maybe, um, maybe you're watching via the live stream, and, you know, I don't know where your heart is as well. And maybe you've left your first love. Maybe you've come back to your first love. Or maybe you've never had the opportunity to fall in love with him quite yet. You know, we're going to give you that opportunity this morning. And, you know, if you're sick in body, if you're struggling with sin, uh, maybe you're just trying to do life, you're trying to do church without your first love, there's hope. Because when you come back to him, he will receive you um, with open arms. He's your first love. He's your father. He will never leave you um, nor forsake you. We don't want to just be going through the motions. We want to be with him as we're going through this season or going through those things that the Lord's brought into our life. So regardless of your circumstances, he will always be waiting for us with open arms. And I know this because he's done it for me so many times. You know, the Lord's been there for me when I've left him and he receives me back because he loves me. He loves us all. And when we come back to our first love, um, we can come back to him because we haven't lost him. In fact, Pastor Chuck once said, there's a difference between losing your salvation and leaving your salvation. If you lose something, you don't know where to find it. You can't lose your salvation because you always know where to find it. You can only leave it. And then the Lord reminds us in the Gospel of Matthew, if you look in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So let's return to our first love, if you haven't done so already, and continue pursuing the Lord's heart um, for our lives. Amen. So if you're joining us here in person, or maybe you're watching on the live stream, and maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, maybe you haven't had the opportunity to fall in love with your first love, which is the Lord quite yet. We want to give you that opportunity this morning and also if you're here in person. Um, So if that's you, if you could just close your eyes, 
bow your head and just repeat this prayer uh, with me. Heavenly Father, this morning I want to declare you as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried. I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I recognize that I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins, Lord, and fill me with your Holy Spirit and use me for your glory. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, we want to welcome you to the family of Christ. And um, I can assure you that the angels in heaven are celebrating on your behalf, right? There's great joy up there even when one sinner re uh, repents. So there's a, there's a celebration going on. If you're watching on the live stream and maybe you want more information about um, our church, you want to learn where you can get connected with a Bible teaching church. If you need a Bible, if you need any information, uh, reach out to us or you can come visit us. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. here at the intersection of Hondo Pass and Gateway South. Uh, 100 and, uh, suite 101 uh, here on Hondo Pass. So if you have any questions, anything like that, please let us know. And um, we, we continue to pray for you. We thank you so much for taking the time this morning to come here to worship with us and to spend some time in the Word together uh, with the body of Christ. Um, we're praying for you once again, and um, we love you, and we hope to see you again uh, soon. So bye for now.